Good Sunday morning, Sobel family and friends. If I've not met you in person, my name is Chris Higginson, and I'm the pastor of Blue Water Church in Kincardine. And let me just uh, take this opportunity to say, Sobel Christian Fellowship, thank you. Thank you for being Blue Water Church's mom. And even though we've uh, moved out of the basement, so to speak, and grown up a little bit and we're on our own, you're still mom and you always will be and will always be your super adorable daughter. If it weren't for Sobel Christian Fellowship, Blue Water Church would not exist, full stop. And if it were not for Pastor Dave Brotherton, Blue Water Church would not have continued to exist. And if it were not for Pastor Dave, I wouldn't be in ministry today. I'd still be in the car business making way more money. Just kidding. Actually, I'm not. I want you to know that I feel really privileged to be able to be here today to share with you from God's word and for the next few uh, Sundays coming up. And I want you to know, uh, Sobel family, from your Blue Water daughter, that we are standing shoulder to shoulder with you in praying for your pastor and uh, for Lisa and Matea and Jackson as well. And I want to pray um, in just a minute. I just want to make a few uh, comments before that. Like me, I'm sure you've noticed that in this age of coronavirus, the, the list of things upon which we can count has shrunk incredibly. Like if you think about it, it was just 35 days ago that you, Sobel Christian Fellowship, met together for corporate worship in this now empty building 35 days ago. It seems to me like so much longer, maybe like 35 weeks but it's in this age of coronavirus that we're really being forced to re-examine a lot of things that we've just previously taken for granted. I find some words from James to be particularly pertinent uh, right now, and I'm going to read from James 4, 13 to 14. Look here, you who say, today or tomorrow we are going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. And here's James's question, so pertinent. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here for a little while, then it's gone. And so things that seemed just a few weeks ago to be so stable and so sure and so certain, now foggy, iffy. Think of the economy. We thought it was so so robust and so sure, now not so much, now iffy, foggy. Think about your retirement portfolio. I talked to one guy in Kincardine who was lamenting the fact that his retirement portfolio essentially dropped about 30% overnight. How's yours? Maybe you thought you had this really bulletproof plan. Now it seems like uh, maybe it's sprung a leak or two. You thought you could count on your job. That's iffy, foggy. And if you're still working, maybe as parents, you know, you always thought you could count on school, you can send the kids to school, and now that's disappeared like the morning fog, and now we've got parents, if they are working, they're learning to work from home often remotely, while at the same time trying to figure out how to homeschool the kids, while at the same time trying not to have World War III kinds of arguments with their spouse, because they're getting underfoot, and it seems like the house is shrinking. Well, travel's changed. We can't just go places like we did. Shopping has changed. I don't know when's the last time you tried going to the grocery store or to the, to the, to the drug store. It, it's a little bit like some of the old episodes of Seinfeld where you're lined up for soup and uh, no soup for you. Well, at least we can watch professional sports, right? Oh, wait a second. That's gone too. So many things have changed. Visiting family has Change. How many of you felt the pain of that last weekend, Easter, Easter weekend, when so often we look forward to spending time with family and that didn't happen so much for you this year? Maybe some of you were alone and that's really, really hard. And whoever thought there'd be this time when we couldn't just meet for church, like that, in all my years on planet Earth, that literally never entered my thinking once. Yeah, we have the odd snowstorm, but it never occurred to me to think that we could not gather for corporate worship. And what about this insane run on toilet paper? 
Like, it, it concerned me a little bit a couple of weeks ago as I was watching the Sobel online service to see um, Jim Nolson very clearly uh, hoarding toilet paper. Actually, I'm just kidding, Jim. That was uh, awesome. I couldn't take my eyes off those structures you were building. But let me just encourage you a little bit as I seem to be trying to encourage myself on almost a daily basis to take this fogginess, this uncertainty, the changes of this season, and rather than allowing them to cause us to turn inward in fear and anxiety, let's rather allow them to be a catalyst, something to propel us along the road of being a fully devoted kingdom disciple follower of Jesus. Because one thing that never changes is the power and the character and the grace and the love of Almighty God revealed in Jesus. Paul, in uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4, uses a phrase I love. He talks about Christ who is your life. Christ who is your life. Don't let anything else be your life. Don't let anyone else be your life. Everything else is foggy. Get your life from Jesus. Get your significance, your value, your security, your sense of being loved, your sense of worth. Get it from Jesus because you, every one of you who's listening to my voice, you are of unsurpassable worth, made in the image and likeness of God and worth Christ dying for. Let's allow the fogginess of this moment to propel us to fix our eyes on Christ, who is our life. You know, if, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus as Lord, if you've received Christ personally, the Bible says some amazing things about you. The Bible says that you're in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, you're a new creation. Colossians 1.27 says that Christ is in you. Paul talks about Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 3.3, your life is hidden with Christ in God. You talk about a safe place, hidden with Christ in God, unshakable, unbreakable. Ephesians 2.6, your life is raised with Christ and seated with Christ in heavenly places. Colossians 2.10 talks about the fact that you're complete in Christ. And then there's just one more verse I love. It's Colossians 3.15. I love it 365 days of the year, but I really, really love it so much more now. Colossians 3.15, Paul says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. There's this tiny word, let, just three letters, so small, and yet so huge in its implication, let. It has the idea that something is all set to take place. It's all rigged to happen. Our job is just to let. Let the peace of Christ rule. Let the peace of the Christ who is in you, the Christ in whom you are, the Christ with whom your life is hidden with God, the Christ who is your life, let, let his peace rule. Let's not go looking for peace in the foggy places. And I think what we'll find is that the peace of Christ will just fill us up as we let him. Let him fill you up today. Let him anchor you today. There's a verse in Hebrews. I can't remember the location of it off the top of my head. But it talks about, the author of Hebrews says, we have this hope, we have this Christ, we have this gospel as an anchor for our souls. Let him anchor you today. Well, I want to pray with you. Uh, right now. And I know even praying is so, so weird uh, like this. I, when I sit at home watching an online service, I'm at prayer time, I'm thinking, is this the time to go refill my coffee cup? Please don't do that. I, I would love it if you would engage with me in prayer. Wait till the sermon to fill your coffee cup. Uh, it's way less important than the prayer time. You're going to get both, but let's, let's do the prayer well. Because I, I honestly believe that when God's people unite together in prayer, and it doesn't matter that we're distanced spatially, it doesn't matter even if you're not watching this as it rolls out live Sunday morning, it doesn't matter one bit. When God's people unite together in prayer, God moves and stuff happens. So I want, you, uh, I want to invite you to engage with me in prayer right now. Let's pray. God, we run to you right now. 
at your invitation. We run to the very throne of grace and you promise that there we will find mercy in our time of need. And God, we need you. We're in a time of need right now and we confess our need. We declare our need. We um, are utterly and completely and entirely dependent upon you, God. And so together as your people, as your body, we just want to come together united in prayer. And we, we just want to come against any agenda that is not sourced in you, God. We come against any agenda of the enemy, and we do so in Jesus' name and on the authority of his name and the authority of the cross. God, in this moment, we want to pray healing into the lives of those who are unwell, who are sick physically, uh, spiritually, emotionally. God, we pray healing. In the name of Jesus, we pray healing into their lives. Spirit of God, would you minister comfort? Jesus, you referred to the Holy Spirit as the comforter, the paraclete. And Spirit of God, would you be ministering comfort and relief and peace? And I'm thinking, especially today, of Pastor Dave and um, Lisa Jackson Matea. God, I pray. Spirit of God, would you just move with healing and power and peace and comfort and, and relief? Would you just hold this dear family up by your right hand? God, thank you for your love. Thank you that you are good. Thank you that in this age of coronavirus, you, you haven't disappeared. You're active, you're moving, you're moving in the midst of this. And God, I pray that you'd give us eyes to see what it is that you're doing in this moment. We know you're comforting, we know you're consoling, we know you're counseling. God, give us eyes to see what you're doing so that we can partner with you in this we don't think for a second that this is a time for Sobel Christian Fellowship or Blue Water Church or any other gospel preaching, Jesus following church to just hunker down and ride this thing out. You're calling us, you're calling us to rise, you're calling us to elevate uh, in ways that are for your glory, for our good, and for the expansion of your kingdom. So God, help us to do that in this moment. Thank you, Spirit of God that you are our teacher and we ask you to be that in this moment as we spend some time in your word. Give us open eyes, open ears, open minds, open hearts, open hands to receive what it is that you have for us today. And we want to receive it, not so that we be somehow smarter, but God, what we want to experience is the transformational power of the spirit making us more like Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, let's get into some teaching this morning. So you guys here at Sobel, you've been in this 2020 uh, teaching series really since the beginning of the year, almost four months into it. So many of you have been engaged in the chronological reading, and then there's been uh, some Sunday teaching that's been paired with that. And that is awesome. That is a really great um, approach to doing ministry and engaging lots of people in the process. Now, having said that, I am going to deviate from that uh, a little bit. And there's a couple of reasons, but let me just tell you one. I felt like it would be a little bit disingenuous for me to kind of parachute here uh, four months into this 2020 thing and then sort of run with it when I haven't done any of the heavy lifting. I haven't engaged, I didn't slog with you guys uh, through Leviticus and all of those kinds of things. And so what we want to do, we don't want the 2020 series to go anywhere other than to be elevated. And so what you've already seen uh, today with, with Barry in a 2020 moment, we want many of you, several of you to be the preachers, several of you who are engaged in the heavy lifting, who are doing the reading, to tell, to talk about what it is that God is doing in your life uh, as you interact with him and his word, how's he strengthening you? How's he challenging you? How's he helping you even in this moment of coronavirus? So going forward, look for many familiar faces uh, to share in 2020 moments. Going to have lots of preachers. And I think this is going to be a really great way to see the 2020 uh, series move forward in a really, really organic way. 
So what we're going to do in terms of deviating from that for a while is we're going to be in a um, probably a four-week series we're simply going to call First Impressions. And uh, we're basically just borrowing that title because First Impressions is the name given to Sobel's welcome ministry. And so we want to talk about welcoming. We want to talk about hospitality. And even as these words are coming out of my mouth, they sound awfully weeny. Um, I can imagine some of you sitting at home thinking, oh, great, we're going to have like a series on hospitality. That's going to be super boring. Why don't we just watch uh, a Martha Stewart video or something like that? But let me just say this. As I've been doing some reading and listening to some podcasts and listening to some talks, uh, checking out people like uh, Andy Stanley and Greg Boyd and John Maxwell and Bruxy Cavey and Andrew Farley, Christine Birch, Carrie Newhoff, um, a lot of these speakers and thinkers have challenged me incredibly in this area of hospitality and developing a theology of hospitality. And what I've come to see is this is a huge kingdom deal. In fact, as I've been interacting with this stuff, I have been experiencing some significant conviction in this. And I don't like that at all. But that is one of the jobs of the spirit, right? To, to bring conviction, to nudge us, to adjust our trajectory. The spirit is the, the, the wind, the pneuma of God, always blowing us in the direction of Jesus. And one of the things that the spirit, I think, is helping me to see, and let me just come perfectly clean here. He's helping me see that I've got some very divisive tendencies in my life. And I think it's like patterns of unrenewed thinking. You've read Romans 12 too. It talks about don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the changing of the way that you think. And I think there's patterns of unrenewed thinking that emanate in divisiveness. And it's not in your face kind of divisiveness. It's more what Greg Boyd would refer to as, as microaggressions. And I'm discovering that I've got these microaggressions that tend to be directed out to those who are on the margins. And in, in Blue Water, we've got drop-in ministry. And so what I've been hearing myself saying is like, those people over there, they need us. They need what we have. We've got the resources that those people need. And what God's helping me see is that there is a grotesque divisiveness in that. There's a grotesque divisiveness in this us and them kind of terminology, even though it's couched in the language of compassion. And what God is showing me is I need to get rid of this. I need to collapse this us, them mindset and to see that it's just us. It's just us, human beings of unsurpassable worth, made in the image and likeness of God and worth Christ dying for. And so I'm hoping that as we enter into this series, I, I want to invite you into my angst. It's no fun being in angst alone. Um, and I don't mean that in the sense that this is going to be shaming or um, guilt-inducing or manipulative. Uh, we don't go for that. But rather, what we want to be is, is a group of people who are open to the Spirit's nudge, to the, to the Spirit tweaking the trajectory of our lives so that we can come in in a little more clearly focused way to the, to the way of Jesus. So we're going to begin with a scripture. We're going to look at a number of scriptures, but the one we're going to begin with is found in Romans chapter 12, and it's verse 13. This is going to be kind of our anchor text. And it says, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. So there's two sentences there, and there's really two chunks to this verse. We're going to talk about the first chunk just for a few seconds, and then we're going to leave it behind. And for the next number of weeks, we're going to focus on the second chunk. But let me just talk about that first sentence, that first chunk for a, for a minute. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Care for the needs that exist within the body. This must happen in a local church 365 days of the year, but it must happen much, much more intentionally and more um, 
with more of a determined pursuit in this age of coronavirus where we're distancing from one another. This is an inward focus. And sometimes churches get criticized for having an inward focused church. A church has to be inward focused. We've got to have an inward focus. Otherwise, we'll not be able to understand the needs of the body nor to care for them. And we must do that. Let me encourage you. Uh, We know we've got Pastor Ken, who's our congregational care pastor, but this can't fall all to one person. It can't be done. This is all of us picking up the phone and calling people, thinking who's in danger of falling through the cracks and reaching out to that person. Let's let's be very, very intentional about this in these days. In fact, um, I think the very, very best, and this is my opinion, but I think the very, very best mechanism for people to experience the care of the local church is to be in a group, is to be in a small group. I think that is where ministry best takes place, where caring best takes place. We're in a group where we can be authentic and transparent and do life together and study the word together and challenge one another and meet one another's needs. I think small groups is the, is the best place for that. You know, that while I'm on this little rant, the New Testament, um, there's 59 one another's in the New Testament. 59 of them. Love one another, care for one another, pray for one another, bear one another's burdens. 59 different ones. It is impossible to do those sitting in rows on a Sunday morning. You cannot do the one another's of the church. That has to be done in circles. Circles are way better than rows. We need both. But let me encourage you, if you're not part of a group, let me encourage you as as, uh, persuasively as I possibly can. Get in a group. Reach out to Pastor Ken. Have a conversation with him. Say, I need to be in a group. There's groups meeting right now by Zoom. You can get in on that. There are, there are meetings taking place uh, right at the moment. We want you to be connected. Having said all of that, we're also not mind readers. If there are needs that are uh, existing in your life or in the life of your family, please tell us what they are. We would love, we would count it a huge privilege and honor to be able to come alongside you and encourage you and help meet needs. This is the job of the church. We care for the needs that exist within the body. Okay, enough said. Almost enough said. I just thought of a verse. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10. I think this is really appropriate. This is Paul talking to the church at Thessalonica. And he basically says to them, you know what, guys? I don't need to tell you how to love each other because you just naturally know how to do that. God is helping you to do that. And let me say, Sobel Christian Fellowship, you're doing a great job at loving each other. You really are. It's a loving church. And what Paul says to the Thessalonians is what I want to say to you now. Just do it more. Just do it more, especially in this era of coronavirus. Okay, that's it. That's enough uh, rant on part one. Let's get to the second part, um, and it's this. Always be eager to practice hospitality. So the first sentence was the inward part. This is the outward part. How do we know this is outward? Well, Paul chooses a very um, particular Greek word here that's translated hospitality, and it's the Greek word philozenia, philozenia. I'm going to say that like a bunch of times over the next week, so you might as well just go ahead and kind of learn it. Philozenia, the philo part comes from phileo, which means to love. The xenia part comes from xenos, which means stranger, foreigner, the other, those who are other than what we are, who are unlike us and unfamiliar to us. So love the stranger, love the foreigner, love the other who is unlike you and unfamiliar to you. And so a xenos person is somebody who is outside of your social group of familiar and comfortable people. There's someone who is unfamiliar to you. There's someone who is different from you, maybe a different ethnicity, a different culture, a different religion, maybe uh, different customs or different styles or different beliefs. They might even seem strange to you. That's where the word stranger comes from. A stranger is a stranger because there's someone who is strange to us. And so we who are the followers of Jesus, we who are in the kingdom... We're called to love the stranger. We're called to love the foreigner. We're called to love those who are other than what we are, who are unfamiliar to us and unlike us. Now, this is a huge challenge because sociologists tell us that this does not happen naturally, that we don't just naturally have a love for those who are different from us or other than what we are. 
In fact, sociologists tell us that this is how social groups are formed, that social groups are formed around commonality and familiarity, and that this us thing, us them thing, is just a natural part of that. That, you know, we're the people who are like this, we're not like that. We dress like this, we don't dress like that. We're the people who eat this food, we don't eat that food. We're the people who speak this language, we don't speak that language. We're the people who, you know, believe these things, we don't believe those things. And so social scientists would tell us that not only do we not have a natural love for those who are strangers, foreigners, other than what we are, but we have a natural suspicion. We're naturally suspicious of them. They're weird. Why do they do that? Why are they like that? What are they up to? And in some circumstances, that suspicion will actually become fear. And there's a word for that. It's called xenophobia. And that's become a pretty common word in the last few years for a number of reasons that I won't get into. But xenophobia, xena from xenos, same word, stranger, foreigner, other. Phobia meaning fear. So xenophobia is a suspicion and fear of the foreigner, a suspicion and fear of the stranger, a suspicion and fear of those who are other than what we are, who are unfamiliar to us and unlike us. Xenophobia is the exact opposite to philoxenia. Xenophobia is a fear of the stranger. Philoxenia is a love of the stranger, a love of the foreigner, a love of those who are different from us. Xenophobia is a fear and a suspicion of them. And right now we're in an era And I think it might even be complicated and maybe even further entrenched by coronavirus, but we're in an era where social groups are becoming more rigid, where this us-them mentality is becoming more entrenched. And I think xenophobia, this fear and suspicion, is actually on the rise. And so what are we called to do? As followers of Jesus, we're called to love. We're called to love the stranger, love the foreigner, and love the other. And we're called not to merely do this in some kind of abstract way, like this is some sort of a Christian pageant, and we just wish love for people, like like, uh, love and, and world peace and things like that. This love of stranger, foreigner, other is very concrete, very specific, and very tangible. We love the stranger so that they don't feel like a stranger. We make room in our life for the outsider so that they can become an insider. It's a breaking down of this us-them dynamic. It's approving the sociologist wrong and demonstrating that you can have a cohesive social unit that's defined by what it's for and not merely what it's against. And so in this um, probably four-part a little mini-series that we're just simply going to call First Impressions. We want to develop this theology of hospitality. We want to learn how do we cultivate an us without a them. And I think what we'll see, I hope, is that this is essential to following Jesus. And there's going to come a time, hopefully in the not-too-distant future, where we're going to be gathered together again and where this building is going to be complete and open to new people entering through our doors. And uh, this is something that we really need to be prepared for with philozenia. Philozenia, love the stranger, love the foreigner, love the other. There's no us in them, it's just Uh, So uh, for the few minutes we've got left this morning, we want to just get into laying a bit of biblical uh, foundation for this uh, so that we can begin to kind of think practically about how we do this, how we can um, more lovingly welcome strangers and be hospitable and uh, more exact in our first impressions. And the first passage I want to just read is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 16 to 18. Therefore, change your hearts and stop being stubborn. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and Lord of lords. He is the great God, the mighty and awesome God, who shows no partiality and cannot be bribed. He ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. He shows love to the foreigners living among you and gives them food and clothing. So you too must Show love to foreigners, 
for you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. Then I want to read from Leviticus 19, 33 and 34. Do not take advantage of foreigners who live among you in your land. Treat them like native-born Israelites and love them as you love yourself. Remember that you were once foreigners living in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So we find this theme running throughout the Old Testament, and there's a number of passages where the people of Israel are given very, very specific instructions on how they were to love the foreigner, how they were to love the stranger, how they were to love the non-Jew. Deuteronomy 26 has this one verse that says, when you bring your harvest before the Lord, set aside 10% of it for the foreigner, orphans, widows, and the poor. This is how God cares uh, for the orphans and the widows and the foreigners and the poor. This is, this is how he feeds them. This is how he clothes them. He does it because God's people uh, provide these things. They offer them up. This is God working through his people. And so God instructs them to take 10% of their produce and to give it for the poor and the foreigner and uh, for those in need. Uh, Leviticus 19, 9 and 10 say these words, when you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields and do not pick up what the harvesters drop. It is the same with your grape crop. Do not strip every last bunch of grapes from the vines and do not pick up the grapes that fall to the ground. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. And so this is how God provides for the poor, for the foreigners, for the widows, orphans, and those on the margins. And I, I do get it. I understand we're free from the letter of the law. And I give a enormous uh, amen to that. But what we need to understand is that there are principles embedded in these precepts that help us to follow Jesus better. Let me encourage you as you're doing your 2020 reading to really learn to read through the Old Testament scriptures through a Jesus lens. Jesus says the whole thing's about him. I think Ken last week mentioned um, about those two disciples who left Jerusalem on their way home to Emmaus. They're super sad. Jesus has died. They don't know about the resurrection. The resurrected Christ kind of shows up alongside them and preaches this incredible sermon. And Luke, Luke says that what Jesus does is he begins with Moses and all the prophets and explains to these disciples everything that the scripture says about himself. So we need to see through a Jesus lens. Um, and so the broader message that we want to grab here, the broader message to Israel and really the broader message to us is this, make room in your life for the poor, make room in your life for the stranger, for those who are other than what you are and unlike you and unfamiliar to you. So this importance was stressed over and over and over again, all throughout the Old Testament. If we could just, for sake of time, just to condense a bunch of verses, it's like God saying, Israel, if you would treat the foreigner as a citizen, if you would love them, if you would care for them, if you would care for the widow and the orphan and those who are vulnerable, then your land would be blessed. But if you mistreat the foreigner, if you don't treat them with respect, and if you don't treat them with dignity, and if you don't treat them like natural born citizens, and if you don't care for the needy, then judgment's going to come on your land. And as you're doing your 2020 reading, one of the things I think you'll find is that one of the very top reasons why nations come under judgment is because they mistreat the foreigner. They don't treat them like citizens. They don't treat them with respect. And they mistreat those who are the most vulnerable. Now, passages about hospitality in the Old Testament, it just makes common sense because hospitality was something that was just absolutely ingrained into the ancient Near Eastern culture, not just in Israel, but in their surrounding even pagan natures. Hospitality was just a core value. This is before the hospitality industry. There's no um, Holiday Inns, there's no Airbnbs, there's no Best Westerns or Best Easterns, I suppose, in this case. And so it was not an uncommon thing. If you're a nice Jewish family, you get a knock on your door at 7 o'clock at night, there's another Jewish family at your door. You've never met them. They're strangers to you, um, but you invite them in. You feed them. You give them shelter. You give them uh, protection. Because that was just kind of a moral code in the ancient Near Eastern 
culture and other surrounding neighbors of Israel's did the very same thing. And so this hospitality talk is not all that unusual, but here's what's very, very unusual is the Israelites are instructed by God to treat all people this way, not just other Jews, but to treat all people this way to care and to feed and to protect foreigners as if they are natural born Jewish citizens. So that makes this very unique in the ancient Near Eastern culture. And it makes it very countercultural, in fact. And another thing that's really unique is we looked at uh, from Leviticus this command to love the foreigner as you love yourself. That's not found anywhere else in ancient Near Eastern culture. This is extremely unique. To, uh, to what God is calling his people to do, to love foreigners as they love themselves, to, to, to love them and to treat them as fellow citizens. Treat the foreigner as if you were that foreigner. And so let me just close with a couple of things here. Um, let's, let's just review these two, two reasons why God is calling the Jewish nation to be hospitable. Number one, because God shows hospitality because God shows hospitality. This is what God is like. And so to be a people of God means you reflect the character of God. That's what it means to be godly. You reflect the character of God. And since God is hospitable, then God's people are called to be hospitable. And so let's learn to see these Old Testament texts through, through a Jesus lens. And I think we can see Jesus in, in phrases like, love the foreigner like you love yourself. That's very Jesus-y. I think the spirit is kind of breaking through there and helping us to see this is something that can enable us to follow Jesus better. And this revelation about a God who shows no partiality, who shows no favoritism, who loves all people equally, who takes no bribes, who cares about the orphans and cares about the needy, and he cares about the vulnerable, and he cares about the strangers, and he loves to provide for them, and he loves to do it through his people. So the nation of Israel is called to be hospitable because God is hospitable. And secondly, Israel should remember. Israel should remember. What should they remember? Well, they should remember what it was like to be a foreigner when they were in Egypt. They, of all people, should remember what that's like. And not just to be a, a, a stranger in a foreign land, but to be enslaved. They, of all people, should know how sucky it is to be mistreated as a foreigner in a foreign land. And so God says, don't do that. Don't do that to anybody else, ever. In fact, do the opposite. Love them. Love them as you love yourself. Treat them as if they're a natural-born citizen. Well, what we're going to do, we're going to leave it there. Next week, we're going to jump into some New Testament scriptures. And the weird thing is, what we're going to see in the New Testament is it's these exact same two reasons, again, that are going to come to the surface but they're going to take on this new and deep and profound meaning as we think about them in light of the cross. Well, thanks so much for joining in today. See you next time.